going to try to. I'm going to go speed through February as well. Uh, so because you have to understand February in order to understand July, uh, if you will. Um, thankfully, Alan did some of my work for me in explaining a little bit about the character of the Russian Revolution uh, and the class character uh, of the revolution, which helps a lot. Uh, I'm going to try to go through the chronology uh, up until July, but also uh, explaining some of the most important events. Uh, uh, something about the character of the February regime, as it's called, or the provisional government and the Soviet um, uh, executive, if you, um, if you will. And I'm also going to try to explain something about the July uprising and why the Bolsheviks took the position they did and why it developed in the way that it did. So that's something, that's more or less what we're going to try to cover. Uh, if we start before the war, and this is an important question to understand a little bit the composition of the revolution, understand a little bit how the, uh, it unfolded. And before the war there was actually massive, the beginning of the revolutionary movement in Russia. This is not often recognized, but actually leading up to 1914, 1912, 1913, 1914 was a continual intensification in the class struggle in Russia, particularly in the working class. You can see the strike waves were increasing and you can see the trajectory was heading towards another 1905 before the war. And actually that's part of the reason why the Tsar went to war, to try to distract the masses attention, try to cut across this movement that was taking place. And he successfully did so for about three years uh, and then it came, or two and a half years, uh, and then it came back with a vengeance. But this intervening period changed a little bit the composition of the movement because if the previous the movement before the war had been solidly working class, also be prim uh, completely dominated by the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks pushed to one side. The intervening years had changed the composition of the proletariat in St. Petersburg in particular, it's the most important cities, city, even St. Petersburg even changed its name to Petrograd. Uh, not that I changed its composition at, at all, but uh, for some reason they changed the name. So Petrograd now had a different, slightly different composition. A lot of the workers have been sent to the front, and new farmers, peasants, have been dragged in from the countryside to work in the factories. Furthermore, uh, Petrograd was also uh, full of um, uh, army units, uh, reserves of the army, also some uh, different kind of uh, sections of the army, regiments and so on, uh, that, had uh, that were dominating the city in a certain way, which hadn't been the case before the war. Obviously, uh, the Tsar's army, I think, consisted of something like 10 million soldiers or something, so there was a very large section of the population had been dragged in uh, to the army. And the overwhelming majority of the army, uh, particularly of the rank and file uh, normal soldiers, were peasants. So the composition of Petrograd had changed, the class character of Petrograd had changed to introduce more of a uh, petty bourgeois element I into the city, if you will. Um, when um, and the workers that had gone through the experience of 1905, 1912, 1913, they had been diluted in composition. Um, in February then, the, um, the actual insurrection uh, took place and uh, more or less spontaneously. The leaders actually of all the parties were either in prison or they were somehow part of the government uh, or they, um, that's the case with the pro-war parties, right? So the pro-war section of, uh, of the socialist parties were in, actually somehow immersed themselves in the government. And the same was true with the liberals uh, and all the kind of constitutional parties and so on, all found themselves involved in the war machinery and uh, uh, the government. Um, the, uh, so when the insurrection took place against the monarchy, it actually took like uh, all the parties by surprise. The Bolsheviks in particular had been heavily suppressed because of their opposition to the war. They were, all the main leaders were uh, in uh, either uh, in prison or in exile. Uh, Lenin, famously, were in, was in Switzerland. The Trotsky, who was not a Bolshevik at the time, but he was in the United States uh, at the beginning of 1917. Uh, Stalin, Kamenev, Sinoviev were all, I believe, in Siberia. Uh, you also found many other of the leading Bolsheviks in Siberia. And this um, 
So this meant that uh, the movement arose more spontaneously uh, from below. This doesn't mean that it was leaderless, completely leaderless. In fact, many of the rank and file Bolsheviks that had survived throughout the war years and so on, involved in the underground work of the Bolshevik party, they actually were the leaders of many of the protests and demonstrations and strikes that took place uh, in, in leading up to the actual overthrow of the monarchy. But in general, it wasn't led by the party as such. And the committee of the party actually opposed the insurrection. They were trying to, they were afraid of it, they were worried that it was going to be suppressed, that it was going to lead to a period of repression and so on. It was premature and they actually uh, cautioned against it or argued against it, um, say, uh, when it was taking place. But uh, things went, were out of their hands. Um, but this was to play a role later on, as I will come back to. But what ha because of this uh, particular situation, what happened when the actual government was then formed, the workers effectively took power, the workers and the soldiers were in control, they had taken power, um, and the liberals very reluctantly actually uh, um, played a role in this. Uh, I will try to explain this in a second. Um, yeah, because of the, most of the main leaders of the Bolshevik party uh, were, were late in coming back to Petrograd because they had been the hev most heavily suppressed. The party machinery was also in tatters. Uh, on top of that, they have this advancement of all these backward layers. So when it came to then the formation, the formation of the Soviet in, on the, the first day of the uh, defeat of the monarchy, uh, this was completely dominated by the Mensheviks and the Socialist Revolutionaries. Socialist Revolutionaries being a kind of petty bourgeois formation with very socialist in its phraseology, but didn't really have a clear program and they were very eclectic. They're like anything goes kind of party, you know, any kind of ideology goes. And then the Mensheviks who was a working class party, but they, uh, as we discussed earlier, had a different position on uh, the character of the revolution and also the general idea of what the working class was to play uh, in Russia at that time. And these were the parties that were pushed to the fore by the masses, who saw these parties the main, uh, uh, as its main representatives. The most class-conscious element, the most active elements to, that partook in the revolution, they were in the minority, and they, were, they would be supporting generally the Bolsheviks, but they were in the minority. On top of that, they also rigged the composition of the Soviets so that it benefited the soldiers versus the workers. So the soldiers had more of a, uh, per person, the, so the soldiers had more delegates to the Soviets than the, um, than the working class. And the smaller units, the smaller uh, factory units, the smaller businesses, the smaller uh, enterprises, they also had more delegates compared to the number of workers than the big factories, right? So it wasn't strictly proportional. So all this meant that the more backward layers of the working class and also of society as a whole, the peasantry and so on, they came to dominate uh, the uh, Soviets in the early stages. So the irony is the working class takes power, but the most active elements lead, lead the workers to power. They would be by and large Bolsheviks. They take the working class to power, but then because of that, precisely because of that, the more backward layers in this form of the Soviet and the elections to the Soviet, they become the dominant after uh, the seizure of power. Well, the, uh, not, uh, uh, and so uh, the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, as was mentioned before, they, are the, uh, they had a different idea of the revolution than the Bolsheviks. Even the Bolsheviks were confused, but they were more clear than uh, the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries. And um, because the Mensheviks insisted on the bourgeois character of the revolution, uh, the bourgeoisie must take power. Uh, this very uh, and also that was positioned more or less of the socialist revolutionaries. And this created a very peculiar regime because the working class had taken power. The workers and soldiers, the workers and peasants, they were effectively in control. But they the, then elected the leadership, which immediately handed over control. Uh, state power to the bourgeoisie. So the workers, they didn't support the bourgeoisie, but they supported the leaders that then handed the power to the bourgeoisie, right? So out of this movement, the overthrowing of Sardivism, came then a bourgeois government, but it was not a bourgeois government that had its own basis in society, but it was completely based and completely dependent on the Soviets for its power. And this was the dual power regime. Um, the Liberals, in fact, had opposed the, uh, the, the downfall of the monarchy. 
uh, in the very last hours of the regime, they were still prevaricating. They were, their solution to the problems of the Romanov dynasty, or the Nicholas II, was to find another Romanov. They wanted another king to replace Nicholas II, because, well, another Tsar, because he was so discredited. So they were desperately looking around for another Tsar. Uh, and they, they fell upon the fact they couldn't find a volunteer. No one wanted to take the throne. Uh, they were all a little bit too attached to their heads and worried that if uh, they could, no one could guarantee their safety, basically, that the revolution wouldn't uh, decapitate them. Uh, and there were good reasons for that, as it turned out. Um, in fact, when the Duma was the kind of, uh, was the kind of uh, most... Uh, the, where the bourgeoisie had concentrated its power, and it was a kind of parliament, but elected in a completely distorted way, where all the richest, uh, richest people got a completely disproportionate say. So although workers got, ha could vote, their votes would be lost, and the peasants as well, they were lost in like, uh, like a completely restricted, like a uh, wonky, uh, a disproportionate representation. So the rich would get disproportionate represented, and Tsarist officials and so on. So this meant that the Duma uh, would be very much dominated by the liberals, even though as a whole these liberals didn't have much of a support in the, uh, in the country. And these had, had, uh, had dominated the Duma during the war years, um, in various, the various shades of liberals, basically, uh, and the bourgeoisie. Um, and they absolutely uh, the de uh, feared the revolution, as I was mentioned before. And uh, one of them, uh, Trotsky describes it like this. Uh, in reality, the government was already without troops. The revolution was wholly in the past. Um, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, sorry. There's something wrong with the quote I got. Rodchenko, who is the leader of the Duma, he subsequently rose. That indicates they had... They had declined the power, so when the Soviets offered them the power, if they had declined it, the Duma would have been arrested and killed off to the last man by the mutiny troops, and the power would have gone immediately to the Bolsheviks. That is, of course, an inept exaggeration, holding the character of the respected Lord Chamberlain, but it unmistakably reflects the feelings of the Duma, which regarded the transfer of power to itself as an act of political rape, i.e. They actually were very upset about the fact that the workers and soldiers had handed them the state power. And they were desperate to do anything to try to hand the power over to the, uh, to the, back to the Tsarist officials, back to the Tsarist monarchy and the old, old regime. And so you have this peculiar situation where workers overthrow the regime, then to elect a leadership which uh, hands the power to the bourgeoisie, who is trying to hand the power back to the uh, old regime, right? And this is very typical, actually, of the kind of situation you find yourself in the revolution. Um, so, and this was uh, then the, the, the kernel of the dual power regime. Um, and it became increasingly clear as time went on that the, precisely how dependent the new provisional government was on the, uh, the Soviets for its power. They didn't have any tr support among the troops and the only way they could defend themselves was by, by relying on the support of the Soviets. Um, and this particular uh, situation was summarized in the slogan that uh, the Bolsheviks put forward. Obviously it was the bread, peace and land but also the crucial question of all power to the Soviets. That is, the Soviets take power. They already, in effect, had the power, but they also just have to recognize it and actually organize the new state. But uh, in the uh, beginning of, uh, in March, April and May, the compromises, as they became to be known, i.e. the ones who wanted to compromise with the bourgeoisie, the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries, they were in majority. Uh, based on the backwardness and inexperienced layers of the masses. And the cre crucial thing here is that the masses as a whole, the most active had active elements knew the difference between the different parties, but the masses as a whole hadn't yet learned how to distinguish between the different socialist factions. They thought they were <laughs> voting for a socialist government when they were voting for the socialist revolutionaries. They had socialist in the name, after all. Same voting for the Mensheviks. Surely that is voting for a socialist government. Um, but it was only a short matter of time before this regime would come to an end. Um, 
Over the beginning in March, the workers forced the implementation of the eight hour working day in a lot of uh, cities around the country. Uh, and this was against the will of the um, Soviets. The leaders of the Soviet opposed the introduction of the eight hour working day. Reason being, well, one, there was the war effort and so on, and they didn't want to uh, antagonize, um, they were worried about the consequences in the army and so on, and the war effort and slowing down production for the war. The other, but the main re reason was they didn't want to antagonize the bourgeoisie, i.e., eight hour working day means a cut in the profits of uh, the capitalist class. And so this would be seen, whatever speeches, and so on. And Trotsky makes the point, you know, you, a lot of revolutionary speeches and so on that bourgeoisie could tolerate, but it's actually the active intervention of the masters in the, into the scene of history, the actions that they take, the strikes and the demands they raise and so on, that is what, what they couldn't tolerate. And quite clearly, the more the workers got involved in politics, the more they started demanding things, the more the bourgeoisie was pushed towards uh, reaction and towards the old regime. And so the, the logic of the Menshevik's position was to try to stop the workers from taking any kind of action, from making any kind of demands on the bosses in the factories or on the political regime, right? To try to keep them back all the time, all the time. Um, and that's, this is why they constantly were opposing uh, new demands like the eight hour working day. Still, they were forced to implement it in a lot of cases because the workers took action themselves. They basically implemented in Petro Petrograd. Uh, some workers just decided to, to stop working at, after eight hours, they went home. Uh, and when the whole factory did this, eventually the boss just had to recognize the fact that this was an eight hour working day. This is, wouldn't normally work, but in a revolutionary situation, things, normal calculations don't exactly apply. So the bosses just had to uh, implement it. Uh, and, this ha and it was wound up uh, effectively becoming an eight hour working day in Petrograd. The s similar kind of situation arose in Moscow, where the workers took strike action and forced the bosses to implement an eight hour working day. Uh, and then, uh, once it had already been implemented, then they got the uh, Soviet to approve it. So, um, that the uh, action from below forced the Soviets uh, to recognize already established facts. In April, uh, the bourgeoisie uh, did their first coup attempt. It was a rather um, uh, pathetic one, but still, it's uh, quite uh, instructive of the kind of correlation of forces. The, um, Milyukov was one of the leaders, uh, was the main leader of the cadet party and he became the foreign minister in this provisional government. And remember now, there's only one socialist minister in the provisional government, so socialist in inverted commas, and that's Kerensky, uh, who kind of self-appointed himself into the ministry. And this was the way things work at that time. He kind of um, uh, tricked, because the line of the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries was really that he shouldn't participate in the government. But uh, Kerensky kind of tricked uh, his way into uh, 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 government and became the sort of socialist in the government. But uh, other than that, it was like a bourgeois government re led by Prince Lvov. As you can tell, he was of the Romanov uh, dynasty, but he was in this case a kind of prime minister of an unelected such. Uh, but Milyukov was the foreign minister. And obviously, in this war, we have the war. And one of the crucial questions of the war was. Uh, how do you win it? How do you go? Uh, how do you also your relationships with the Allies? And basically, Russia throughout this period had more or less kept us down still. There wasn't any much fighting going on on the, between the German or, uh, and the Russian fronts. They more or less like had become like an unofficial stalemate, which obviously then meant that the Germans could move troops from the Eastern Front to the Western Front, where they were fighting the French and the English. And uh, uh, the um, the uh, Allies, the French and the English in particular, or the British, were very keen on getting Russia to resume the offensive. So they were conducting a campaign uh, in the spring of trying to get uh, the government to resume the offensive. And part of this was also the question of uh, annexations. The demand of February really was peace with no uh, annexations. There is a universal peace proclaimed by all the warring parties, a democratic peace with no annexations. So no, no country should uh, like basically gain or lose out of a war, but everyone should just uh, uh, give up fighting and there should be no annexations. That was the kind of democratic idea that was in mind of the workers and the peasants when they fought in February. Um, 
But uh, the new regime that came to power was bound up obviously with the bourgeoisie and, uh, and through the bourgeoisie also with the old aristocracy and they had not in, did not have in mind the peace without annexations, they wanted some peace of the spoils. Uh, and in particular they were the uh, English and the, the British and the French who were financing the government, giving them loans and so on, supplying them with weapons and ammunition and um, they were keen, def uh, most certainly keen on making sure they got their piece of the pie uh, in whatever peace negotiation came. And you, if you studied the Treaty of Versailles, which followed on from the war, you can see what kind of punitive um, uh, uh, impositions were, uh, uh, were given on the German people uh, as a result of their capitulation in the war. The kind of punishment they were given and what the British grabbed and the French grabbed, all the German colonies, but also reparations which crippled the German economy for decades afterwards. So this peace without annexations was a complete anathema, obviously, to the imperialist character of the war. <laughs> but they, uh, and Milyukov then wrote a letter to the Allies promising, basically, to continue the war on their terms. I, no peace without annexations, but actually keep going uh, on, on the way that it has been. But he covered it in a few clever phrases, but that's basically what he told them. And this wasn't lost on, on anyone really, and, um, and so this caused a big uproar, a big scandal, and, um, but it was a deliberate pro provocation on his behalf to try to provoke uh, a kind of uh, confrontation between the compromisers and the Bolsheviks, or if you will, between the compromisers and the workers, uh, who were opposed to the war, obviously, uh, at this stage, and uh, the, the compromisers he was trying to push them, basically push them towards the side of the bourgeoisie by making this provocation. Uh, but the, uh, the time wasn't quite right yet. The, the compromises hadn't yet uh, uh, been pushed far enough, they couldn't uh, take the step. And so um, uh, the Bolsheviks mobilized protests, there were uh, workers and soldiers, they came out in their thousands protesting against uh, Milyukov's uh, note. And this pushed down the Soviets to demand concessions of the government. The, go the government must immediately retract this. They must write a new note to the Allies saying that we can't be in favor of annexations and so on. And obviously the Ally, uh, the government refused. Milyukov in particular refused. Uh, it was adamant that he would never write a new note. And so they settled at a compromise, which was they were going to exploit an explanatory note that explained the original note. Um, and this explanatory note wound up being that Russia, uh, Russia uh, declined its right, uh, its uh, annexations, but it still supported the Allies' annexations. So you're still fighting an imperialist war, no longer admittedly on the of your own bourgeoisie, but just on the other imperialist bourgeoisies of France, France and Britain. That's effectively kind of the kind of compromise that settled. This is not a compromise at all, it's basically the compromise has kind of caved in to the demands of British and French imperialism. And they, British and French imperialism were quite happy with this kind of result. They weren't that keen on Russia getting Constantinople, which was the key war aim of Russia, to get Constantinople. The, Russian, the British and the French weren't keen on giving them that anyway. Uh, they probably wouldn't have, uh, even if they had won the war. Uh, and so they ha they were, this was, a, very, this was a, uh, a deal which was very much uh, in, according to their liking. And it very much fitted, as Alan described uh, Kerensky before, as an agent of British and French imperialism, which is what he became. And so, uh, but, um, but through this pressure, yeah, anyway, it created, this was forced also, which created now another kind of pressure, which was that the socialists should enter into the government. Uh, and this came from two directions, really. On the one hand, the bourgeois wanted them to come into the government to take responsibility for all the shitty decisions that the government was taking, all the bad decisions that the government was taking. So the, the bourgeois wanted them into the government to take responsibility for all of this. They didn't want them to just commenting and attacking them from the sideline. But they wanted them to take responsibility. And on the other hand, the workers, a lot of workers and um, soldiers and peasants were thinking, hey, well, we only got one minister at the moment. If we get six ministers into the government, then maybe we'll have more of an influence and we'll be able to get more of our demands through in question of land, in question of bread, and in question of peace. So, they, so actually from two different directions, like two different class points of view, that this pressure came uh, for the socialists to enter the government. And uh, when Milyukov resigned on the 2nd of March, May, sorry, 2nd of May, 
uh, this actually took place then. And this, the Soviets entered in, they made sure they were still in the minority, so they were a third of the government. Um, and they, but they were given nice tasks like Tsertseli, who was leader, one of the leaders of Mensheviks, who became Minister of Labour. I think, or was it? No, it wasn't Tsertseli, he became something else. Well, anyway, a Menshevik was given Minister of Labour. Uh, Kerensky became Minister of uh, the Army and the Naval Forces. I, they were take, given full responsibility for all the bad things the government had to do. I, suppressing the strikes, fighting the working class uh, uh, in the factories, and also fighting the war and the upcoming offensive that now be was being pushed for. And the main slogan of this government that came into being, there was a lot of nice phrases about constituent assembly and so on, but no one believed in that. The main point of this government was now to drive for a new offensive against the Germans. And that, that became the whole guiding uh, atmosphere of the coming months, which wasn't lost on the uh, workers. Um, now I've lost myself in the notes. And yeah, the reason for this uh, offensive, there was twofold. On the one hand, they wanted the, obviously the military gains that was possible to gain uh, and the pressure, increased pressure on Germany, uh, which will also relieve some of the pressure on the Western Front then from the British and the French. In particular, the French we were upset because they were worried about the impact that the Russian Revolution was having on the army, the French army. And they were, uh, they were, uh, they were uh, thinking on the one hand they would get a little bit less pressure, less, have to put less pressure on their armies. On the other hand, it's also about tainting the revolution. Uh, the political advantages of having the revolution, the Russian revolution, fight for their imperialist aims would taint and dirty the revolution in the eyes of the workers of the West. That was another aim. Furthermore, inside of Russia, you had the, uh, the, the obviously this would uh, give a new um, a new boost to the very demoralized counter-revolutionary forces that have been completely routed. They actually attempted, at the time of the note uh, to the foreign governments, they actually attempted a bit of a, uh, that's why I described it as a coup, the first attempt. They, they tried to get Kornilov, who, General Kornilov, who appears in August, but he made his first attempt there. He was commander of the garrison in Petrograd, and he tried to get the troops to mobilize in order to suppress the Bolsheviks. But at that time, the Mensheviks and the Socialist Revolutionists were clever enough to understand this was a very bad route to go down. And so they actually, uh, they actually issued an order, which was that no soldier was to move anywhere, no regiment was to go anywhere without the express permission of the Soviet. And this had to be countersigned and so on by the President of the Soviet, etc. And so, although they were saying, hey, we, we, are not, they, we, we cannot take state power, the Soviets cannot take state power, they were, in fact, this, so the, and the bourgeois government was being controlled, they actually countermanded the order of, of the general. So the state had its representative in Petrograd, who was supposed to be in charge of the army, but he was effectively not in charge of the army, but the Soviets were in charge of the army. And when this order was given, no troops moved. And in fact, even before the order was given, a lot of troops were already refusing to move because they hadn't had an order from the Soviet. So the, the actual command structures of the, the so-called bourgeois government completely reliant on the permission of the Soviet. They couldn't move any armies around without the permission of the Soviet. And this was a real balance of forces. And that's why that attempt at the coup failed. And it's also, incidentally, why the attempt at a coup in August failed, uh, which hopefully Dan will deal with some way. But so the demoralization of the counter-revolution uh, was one of the reasons also for this offensive, to try to reinvigorate it around uh, this uh, patriotic offensive. And that was, if, if they were successful in the offensive, they obviously give a lot of patriotic feeling and so on. Uh, you know, look at how great we're doing. But also if they were, uh, if they were not successful in the offensive, the demoralization of the course, the misery and the demoralization will also be to the benefit, at least in the short run, of the counter-revolution, which was also proven in July and August uh, as it happened. Um, but uh, in the end, the, uh, the, re the offensive wound up breaking the back of the February regime, of the compromises. It was their last gasp, in a sense. But before this would become clear, uh, we, uh, we come to June and then to July. Um, but all these uh, kind of uh, fights around the Soviets and the increasing uh, was also developed, and the the all the constant um, 
uh, prevarications of the Soviet government, the failure of the uh, provisional government to deliver any kind of reforms that was part of what the workers and the peasants and the soldiers fought for in February. Uh, the failure of this meant that the, the Bolshevik slogans becoming increasingly popular, particularly among the most active layers of the population. You have to also remember that most of the country never participated in the February Revolution. The February Revolution was uh, uh, carried out in Petrograd pretty much alone. Okay, the most of us were supported by the rest <coughs> of the population, but they didn't actually take part in the actions. Which meant that they had didn't, had, didn't have a particular uh, experience themselves of struggle against the counter-revolution. They hadn't actually participated in revolutionary activity themselves. So most of the lessons that were been learned during February were confined to Petrograd. And obviously some other places like Moscow and so on and some of the working class, other working class areas. But most, so this also meant that although Petrograd, they had understood quite a lot about the character in the early stage, the, other, the rest of the country was lagging far behind. So in the uh, beginning of June, uh, you actually start having like a serious turn towards the Bolsheviks in the working class areas. It wasn't quite yet reflected in the Soviets, but it was a clear turn. The membership of the Bolshevik party increased dramatically. Uh, they also got more delegates. And what, the first thing that happened was that the uh, district Soviets in Petrograd, which was like Vyborg and these working class districts of, of Petrograd, they, their local Soviets, they started having uh, becoming dominated by uh, the Bolsheviks and uh, even if the city-wide Soviet was um, dominated still by the Mensheviks and the SRs and uh, gradually so you can see that wherever the working class now got a chance to vote and like new representatives replaced the old representatives with new ones they tended to be Bolsheviks and the, the lo more local ones, the more close you were to the working class, towards the roots, the factory committees, and the uh, district Soviets, the closer you got to the ranks of the working class, the more the Bolsheviks were now dominating. Um, and uh, the struggle between the compromises and the Bolsheviks was reaching uh, a fever pitch. Uh, and this was at the time of the All-Russian Congress of the Soviets. And that was both the workers, the peasants, and the soldier Soviets who came together in June. And this was overwhelmingly dominated. The Soviet was overwhelmingly dominated by uh, the um, Mensheviks, the SRs, and the uh, uh, non-partisan uh, uh, delegates. Out of 770 something delegates, the Bolsheviks had 100 or something like that. Yeah? So they were in a small minority. Um, uh, because most of these uh, delegates have been elected in the past, if they had elected all on that particular day, probably they would have had a much bigger delegation. <coughs> probably not the majority still, or even close to it, but they would have had a bigger delegation because everything was lagging behind. All the elections, elections always, representative democracy always means a certain lag in develop, political development. I mean, it's most obvious in the case of like Britain or something like that, which are elected every four or five years, yeah? where well, it become a real massive lag between the actual changes in the mood of the class and the actual elections to parliament. Like uh, a president can rule, with, even if someone hate, he's completely hated by the population, like was the case with Holland, um, he can rule for three or four years, even if everyone hates him. So it's a big lag. But also the Soviets, even though they had much more regular elections, still this all provided a lag which in a revolution, a month or a week, could be re uh, is a very long time. Normal times it would be considered not a lag at all. But in a revolution it, it becomes a much longer time. And so this uh, dominated Congress. And the other fact was this was a national event with all the delegates from all parts of the country, including the most rural, backward areas, as well obviously as Petrograd, but Petrograd was uh, not uh, so prominent. So this, you had this, so suddenly appears this clash between all the delegates of the conference of the Soviet, which is supposed to be the representative revolution, and the real revolutionary forces of Petrograd, the ones who actually carried out the revolution, and this becomes this clash where the two meet for the first time, and it's uh, a peculiar mix. The Bolsheviks attempt to organize a demonstration. Uh, where they're demanding all powers to the Soviets and so on, effectively for the, this Congress, which is now taking place, to, to take power. It wasn't like a hostile thing, it was like, in a sense, it was friendly. But the Soviets, uh, the compromises, they were, thought this was a very hostile act. And they uh, issued a decree, 
uh, on the first day, I think, banning all demonstrations for three days, uh, in particular the uh, Bolsheviks. And uh, they, um, and this is another thing, they, they effectively assumed again state power. They're not supposed to be able to do these things. They were both, like the, the Soviets are not supposed to be state power. But you can see uh, gradually over time this, the Soviets take on more and more state power. Uh, and there was like a kind of uh, logical uh, development. Most of the local Soviets have already taken uh, on policing matters and so on, even if it wasn't recognized. Some of the Soviets had even completely taken power, like in Kronstadt, for example, they kicked out, they even imprisoned the bourgeois administration. So the state, administ the official state administration had been imprisoned. And there was a big conflict between the Petrograd Soviet, who demanded of the Kronstadt Soviet that they hand over these. Uh, uh, administrators because they have, were in prison and uh, they, were, they almost came to an armed clash before Trotsky had to go down to Kronstadt and convince them to hand, ha hand these official over, uh, officials over in order to stop a, a bloodshed. Anyway this was in May. Um, so by this time you have a real pitch, fever pitch and in the end the Bolsheviks uh, said okay fine we won't have our demonstration. We made a point we but we won't have our demonstration uh, and then uh, the Congress of the Soviets, they sent out all the delegates to speak to the factories, speak to the, all the uh, troops in the factories. And all real, um, like one of these moments where these delegates came into contact with the revolution for the first time and the Bolsheviks were rubbing their hands. This was precisely what they were after. If, Trotsky said, if, if, uh, if uh, the mountain can't come to Muhammad, then Muhammad must come to the mountain. Uh, so the delegates went to the workers and they were very pleased with the outcome. In the end, then the Soviets called their own demonstration and thought, aha, they thought, well, now we're going to show them. Uh, and they called the demonstration, sent out all the delegates again to all the factories to agitate and so on. And the workers turned up, not with the slogans of the compromises and of the official Soviet slogans, but all the Bolshevik slogans, all power to the Soviets, down with the offensive, uh, the military offensive, and so on. Uh, and this was uh, what happened in June, and obviously scared the compromises to no end. They realized now for the first time properly how they had completely lost their basis of support in the working class. And it was a decisive moment. Uh, but obviously nothing was resolved. There was a resolution raised at this point by Sagatelli, Sagatelli who was the, one of the ministers in the provisional government. He was a minor minister, junior minister, but was also the head of the executive committee of the Soviets, the president of it. Um, and he raised a resolution for the uh, banning of the Bolshevik party, effectively. And so, uh, but most of the compromises weren't prepared to go that far at that point in time. So this was about a few weeks before the July days. Um, but um, the mood was, uh, had shifted rapidly in favour of uh, the Bolsheviks. It should be also be remembered that this was in favour of the Bolshevik slogans. It wasn't necessarily in favour of the Bolsheviks taking power like in, they did in one, were to do in October, but it was in favour of the Bolshevik slogans. So even Mensheviks and SRs who were demonstrating in these demonstrations with Bolshevik slogans on their banners, they had not yet necessarily drawn the conclusion that for this to happen, the Bolsheviks must be the ones in charge, right? They might have thought that they were just there to pressurize, still, the Mensheviks and the SRs into taking power themselves. And to understand these different moods and these different ideas that are in people's heads as they're participating in these demonstrations and not taking things for granted is quite an important one. Because otherwise you can make mistakes. And quite a lot of, there were a few Bolsheviks at this time who made precisely the kind of mistakes. They're thinking, hey, now the masses are with us, now we can go and take power. And we're arguing for things like seizing the telephone exchange, seizing the post office and so on, uh, basically for another insurrection against the provisional government. And uh, the karma heads, <laughs> Lenin in particular, he, called, he, he described these as being a, a wee bit ultra-left. He described them as um, a v or v uh, or leaning a wee bit to the left. He said, and he said he argued instead for the slogan they advanced in April already of patiently explaining. Right? If we have to continue to patiently explain because we have a, okay, we won a section of the working class in Petrograd, a section of the working class vote for us, and then there's another section who will adapt our slogans, but actually the whole mass of the working class, even in Petrograd, are not yet quite clear about what is necessary. Um, and that's just in Petrograd, but they're also outside in the rest of the country. What is the situation there? And July days would prove precisely that Lenin was correct. 
Um, but the Moody and the workers was not that. They weren't, they weren't really, and the soldiers in particular, uh, they weren't really um, uh, a mood of uh, patience. But actually increasingly, uh, as they also faced provocations from the government. And the government was starting to uh, announce plans, moving the most revolutionary regiments, splitting them up and sending them off to the front. Which is close to death sentence, not quite a death sentence, but it's quite close to it. Uh, and obviously means to be diluted also in the mass of um, other uh, soldiers who are not as revolutionary. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so this was so this was a clear um, provocation on the part of the government to, to kind of punish the most revolutionary elements and then bring in more backward regiments from the front and put them in Petrograd. And so, uh, quite correctly, a lot of soldiers as well as workers felt that this move was a counter-revolutionary move. Like it was, uh, it would no longer be loyal regiments loyal to the revolution that would be protecting Petrograd, and it was a pro provocation. Um, and so they, uh, they were pushing and pushing and pushing for the Bolsheviks to organize a coup. Uh, sorry, to organize a protest and demonstrations and so on. Uh, soldiers are not ones generally to be kind of uh, the most patient types. And they were insisting also of bringing arms. Uh, the Kronstadt sailors again, they definitely were not the patient types and they, were, uh, they, were, um, they basically voted a resolution and they were bringing all, they came en masse, they sailed up uh, into Petrograd with their arms uh, in, and they even seized, uh, implanted themselves in a number of fortresses and so on inside Petrograd which was later used in order to justify this lie that the Bolsheviks had attempted to seize power in July. In fact the Bolsheviks all through this process because of the line of Lenin were trying to stop the demonstrations. They were going to into the factories telling them you shouldn't demonstrate, it's the wrong move at the moment, this is uh, only going to provoke, we haven't just won the country and so on. They were trying to convince the workers and the soldiers who were going to barrack as well of not moving but the workers and the soldiers weren't hearing any of it and it's precisely this question that in February they moved jumped over the heads of the leaders now although they play a very progressive role at that time at this particular time their mistrust of leaders in general played a negative role and they actually wouldn't hear it they thought well we could do it in February everyone was telling us not to do it in February and we did well then so let's do it again and so uh, they attempted, uh, they organized this protest and they went to the Bolsheviks and demanded their support. And the Bolsheviks tried their best not to support it, but in the end they uh, relented and they said, well, it's better if we take control of these demonstrations than if they happen without any kind of leadership, without any kind of control. And that will inevitably lead to a worse situation. And again, the fact that the, the, the uh, Bolsheviks were willing to put themselves at the head of this demonstration in order actually to hold it back, but that was used as uh, an argument to say they were actually from the very beginning attempting to um, uh, ta take power in July. And it's still being put out by bourgeois historians all over the place that oh, they were already trying in July and this conspiracy of the Bolsheviks in July. But it's actually complete nonsense. They were trying to hold the masses back at that point in time. It's a different thing in uh, October, but at that time they were saying like we have to hold it back. Um, the um, um, and even there was even a, they even had to print the blank page of Pravda because when they made the pa paper, the paper had a front page saying no demonstrations, and then uh, it, they changed the line and they had to and they couldn't uh, ch you know in those times it takes a bit longer to set these days to print the papers very quick. In those times it took a lot it was a lot slower, so they had to print the blank page because they didn't have time to set the proper. Uh, fonts for the front page. So Pravda came out with a blank front page. Again, then the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Mensheviks and the SRs, they then claim, oh, that just shows they were trying to print uh, a slogan for calling for an insurrection, and then they changed their mind, yeah? So they, they completely used all these different minor things in order to blame the Bolsheviks and claim that they had taken some kind of premature action. Um, also came f um, for, forward now the lie of the German gold. Now it's complete invention. 
uh, it's still circulating history, history books, but there's German gold, that Lenin had all this German gold. And Trotsky makes the point that they were the least, the party with the least money. They had the least, all the time struggling to make their finances. The paper didn't reach, it, the very irregularly reaching places because they couldn't afford to send it. They didn't have enough money to send the paper to the front, so, that's, so a lot of the time didn't appear to, uh, at the front. They actually had to organize special collections in order to set, among the Bolshevik supporters, in order to uh, send the copies of Pravda and send it to the front. Uh, so they didn't have any money. They had to organize a special collection in order to build a print shop, which was now to be destroyed, and so on. Uh, so this was a complete fabrication, um, which was based basically on a few lies of uh, some uh, very, uh, um, yeah, uh, secret service people, basically, um, so who just made it up. And then uh, it was repeated. First, the Mensheviks and the SRs were trying to stop it. They were uh, defending the Bolsheviks, at least to some extent, against the slander. But now in July, they, had, they completely changed their tune. And in fact, when they were struggling to keep the uh, barracks loyal, they found that the only thing that could actually uh, keep the barracks uh, with the provisional government was this lie about Germany. So they found that it was useful. In this particular, on this particular demonstration, when they were trying to mobilize support for the provisional government, the only thing they found that stuck was this particular lie about Germany. And so they started spreading it and spreading it and spreading it. Um, and particular counter-revolution spread it through the liberal press and so on. And uh, if you look at how Jeremy Corbyn is treated in liberal press now, you can see something a little bit of a taste of exactly um, uh, how that uh, transpired. In the end, the demonstration unfolded largely peacefully. Again, provocations, officers, uh, old officers, uh, officers in the army, police, the old police, which has been dissolved, uh, they all had uh, ranged various kind of uh, um, sniper positions and so on. There was shooting at the demonstration from lofts, from windows, etc. Um, uh, but the Bolsheviks were constantly trying to restrain the demonstration, stopping from uh, causing a confrontation with any of the army units. Uh, one particular Cossack regiment uh, was out uh, trying to uh, arrest um, people, but there was only one, there was about 100 Cossacks. In the whole of Pe Pe Petrograd, the, uh, uh, the government could only find 100 Cossacks that were prepared to do its bidding at this particular point in time. And they actually, and they had to restrict themselves to guerrilla raids. They couldn't attack the demonstration full frontal, but they had to restrict themselves to guerrilla raids. And that was this kind of balance of forces in Petrograd at that time. And if the Bolsheviks had wanted to seize power in Petrograd at that time, they would have no trouble doing so. But the point to us, that even if they had t seized power in Petrograd, it would have been a very short-lived affair because the rest of the country was not with them at this time. Uh, so the demonstration proceeded more or less, um, uh, the government is scrambling all over the country to try to find loyal regiments to come to their aid. Uh, there is a, a very peculiar incident where one of the regiments turn up, their aim is actually to protest, to participate in the demonstration, but there was a confusion and one of the, mini one of the government ministers think they're there as a loyal regiment sent from the front. And so they invite them to guard the government palace. And uh, this regiment was, was Bolshevik. Uh, they asked Trotsky for his advice, and Trotsky said, Well, yeah, sure, go ahead, guard the palace. It's better to have our people guarding the palace than to have uh, uh, any kind of reactionaries guarding the palace. And so, one of the, so you can see something of the confusion that reigned in the time of, uh, uh, in this particular time. No one really knew who to trust. But, you can see, but the mood quickly turned. It was the evening, I can't remember, the, is it the 4th of July or something like that? I can't remember the exact date. Uh, and the mood was turning. They were spreading the slides over Germany uh, about uh, Lenin being a German agent and so on. And also, this, um, they were using this um, uh, particular uh, threat of... Um, they were using the visions of how many of the workers, they were expecting this demonstration. They weren't really expecting to take power as such. They were expecting to go there to threaten the Bolshevik, uh, the, uh, sorry, not the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks and the SRs into taking power. A lot of them still had this illusion that somehow if they could only show enough force, then the Mensheviks and the SRs would actually take power. 
uh, they call themselves socialists after all, and only with enough show of force they would be able to uh, succeed with their aims. Um, but um, the Mensheviks and the SRs now conclusively came over to the side of uh, the bourgeoisie and against the workers, and against the soldiers uh, and against the Bolsheviks, which was the same thing in reality. And uh, they moved, they let these lies fester in the press about the Bolsheviks being agents. They spread uh, of Germany, they also spread a lie that they were trying to uh, ferment an insurrection, which they knew not to be true, but it, it didn't matter, it was a useful lie. Or they weren't necessarily the ones spreading it the most, but they refused to deny it. And so they, uh, you will constantly have, so the counter-revolution was spreading all these lies and the Soviets would go out and say, hey, it's not, we're, not, we're not going to intervene in this. And obviously this mobilized the counter-revolution. The counter-revolutionary elements now appeared on the streets again for the first time for several months. The, uh, all the petty bourgeois and bourgeois layers of the population in Petrograd came out onto the streets and they started um, beating up workers and so on when they saw them. They uh, brought in from uh, outside of Petrograd some loyal regiments, the most reactionary troops, uh, arrive in Petrograd to start spreading this hysteria about Germany, or German agents, agents of the Kaiser, etc. And uh, you get uh, uh, detachments, now army units, who become incensed. They uh, move on the um, Bolsheviks' uh, headquarters, which were located in the palace of, uh, Nefer of a notorious uh, mistress of the Romanovs, and, um, which they had taken over, or rather, an army unit had taken it over and then handed it over to the Bolsheviks. Um, but again, the Bolsheviks are constantly avoiding confrontation. They had many opportunities. There were many loyal, there were soldiers who were asking uh, to fight against the counter-revolution at this particular time. But the Bolsheviks are urging caution all the time. So we have, even here in the when they faced basically now we're being illegalized. They are still saying, hey, this is not the time. We can't fight this at this moment in time. It will be it will become our time later, which was uh, to be shown. And this was. Um, uh, then began the month of the Great Slander, as Trotsky calls it, when this slander became universalized across the whole of uh, the country, and the, uh, all the lies about German agents and so on, the insurrection, uh, that uh, the Bolsheviks wanted um, uh, unilateral peace agreement, you know, to sign a peace agreement with Germany, hand over all the Russia, whole, all of Russia to Germany, etc. All of these lies were being spread. But in the meantime, whilst uh, the, the situation in Pet uh, Petrograd became quite desperate in this period, it also this time period of the next couple of months, uh, and a lot of the leading Bolsheviks had to go into hiding. Um, Sinoviev and Lenin went into hiding, uh, not so much because they feared prosecution, they didn't mind that too much to be prosecuted, but they feared that all this hysteria that was being whipped up would me mean that if they were arrested, they would never go to trial. They'll be killed somewhere along the way. Much like happened to Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in Germany in 1919, when uh, they were arrested by uh, government troops and then killed before they ever got to a, to a prison. So, uh, Sinoviev and Lenin uh, went underground and didn't reappear for two months. Trotsky, his position was slightly different and he stayed and he uh, uh, went on trial uh, in, in, this, uh, in July. But the whole situation was, uh, mo most of the Bolsheviks, uh, or a lot of the Bolsheviks now went on trial. The party press, which they bought, collected a lot of workers' hard-earned money. They were, um, the printing press facility was smashed to pieces by the troops. The Pravda was banned. Uh, Bolshevik literature was banned. Um, and the party effectively uh, went underground again. But as you see, this, this temporary uh, move forward or the uh, retreat of the revolution and the advance of the counter-revolution it only prepared like have we seen so many revolutions since like this temporary retreat only prepared the way for a much greater step forward which was going to take place a month later uh, which uh, Daniel will uh, go into later on